This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com. If there's one thing I know about tenant improvement allowances, it's that everybody does it differently. So that's why I wanted to dive into that topic today. Tenant improvement allowances, also known as TITIA. We're going to break it apart. We're going to talk about negotiating TI allowances, how to structure TI, uh, landlord oversight and approval rights on what is considered tenant improvements and what is not, as well as any you know ownership TI and landlord restoration obligations uh, as the lease is ongoing. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast. This is another Brokers Roundtable live from across North America uh, at each of our offices. So, gentlemen, welcome, uh, welcome back to the show. Chad, let's kick it off with you, man. Talk to us about negotiating tenant improvements. Let's let's start off from the the tenant perspective, then we'll go back around and talk about from the landlord perspective. So when you're representing a tenant, what do you want to make sure that you are negotiating for? Uh, like what are your must-haves and what are your wants as you're going through those negotiations? Yeah, I think you teed it up quite neatly by describing it as different in every scenario because there's some tenants that will want and prioritize certain things over others. They might want to have a lower face rate. They might want to have a lower deposit. They might want to have no personal indemnity. They might be sensitive to the lease term, whereas other tenants might be more agnostic to that and they might want to have more of a priority on the ti's that get spent in there on industrial quite often it's pretty cut and dry you start seeing basic cosmetic things for the most part new carpet new paint in the in the office area and for the most part a lot of warehouses are fairly ubiquitous and function the same for most users where it starts getting more complex is uh, for an individual company that might need something advanced in there. And that could be a crane, it could be heavier power, it could be oversized doors. That's when it starts getting very complex and it becomes a function of how much rent the tenant is willing to pay in order to get those higher TIs in there. Uh, industrial is pretty straightforward. Like for the most part, you might see $5 a square foot for just basic cosmetic improvements. And then anything over and above that might get amortized into the lease, but it gets it gets very complex when tenants want anything more than that basic TI that most landlords will offer. And I'm sure uh, uh, Jesse and Adam can get into the office and retail side on it becoming a lot more elaborate and specialized. Uh, but for the most part, most TIs in industrial negotiation are pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean that's one of the reasons that I typically recommend industrial real estate for beginners in you know beginner investors in the commercial real estate. It's a, it's a little bit more straightforward in some ways. It's more complex in other ways. Uh, but that's always a nice thing, right? Because tenant improvements, while you can you know amortize it back into the rent and actually increase the value of the property based on your NOI, uh, it's another expense out of pocket, right? And a lot of newer investors may not necessarily have that. Adam, let's dive into retail, man. I mean, retail is such a beast when it comes to TI. That's like half of what you guys negotiate. Yeah, I was laughing uh, during during that description because because everything that was just said about how it was straightforward and and, and simple <laughs> turned upside down. This is this is going to sound like I'm lying, but I was just going back and forth with a, an institutional owner developer on a, an, a tenant requesting three hundred dollars per square foot uh, on a deal uh, that literally came across my desk an, an hour ago, if, if that. So uh, it, it is, it's a completely different ball game. Now, is that, is that, are we going to agree to that? No. Is that standard? No. But $5 a square foot is, is we just don't see a lot of that. But, uh, but where the, the crane comment, I, I think made a lot of sense on the industrial, um, on the industrial side of things, retail is like, building a freaking battleship or a submarine kitchen, right? Like there is so much cost that goes into such a small portion of the space that they can get crazy, right? So especially on, on restaurant deals, I mean, you just get really exorbitant TI requests 
especially as it relates to first generation space. And without getting into the weeds, because I'm, I'm known to do that when I talk about this stuff. So apologies to all the listeners and, and my esteem. Hey, that's what this is for. Let's do it. Uh, the, the mechanical electrical plumbing loads in restaurants specifically can just be exhaustive. Like I, I did a, a, a deal that was, you know, flirting with 10,000 square feet where the, the HVAC package was over half a million bucks just for HVAC. Um, and you, you can just, you can, the, the amount of money you can spend is insane. Um, so Tyler, I think, I think what you said makes a lot of sense about how I, I've seen a lot of people that specialize in, you know, everything from residential to office to maybe just like soft goods retail, try to do, uh, more intricate restaurant deals and, and it never ends well. Um, I think that TI is an absolute case by case basis. I think the, the security involved in TI gets very, very tricky because if I'm representing the landlord, I'm saying, are you crazy? You want, let's just use a hundred bucks a foot because a hundred dollars a foot is kind of the new normal on restaurant deals. It's not shocking. A hundred bucks a foot five years ago, you would have got, I would have gotten yelled at for presenting it. Now, it, now it's become pretty normal with construction costs going crazy. <laughs> yeah. Back um, then they probably would have reported you to the real estate commission. Like this guy needs yeah, to get exactly. his license taken away. That's my license with, with, with <laughs> torches. Uh, but because, so if I'm on the landlord side, I'm saying hundred bucks a foot, you're, I want a personal guarantee. I want letters of credit. I want yada, yada, yada secu to securitize this. Right. So that's when I'm wearing my landlord hat, I'm saying that, but I do a lot of tenant rep work. And when I'm wearing that hat, I'm saying, Hey buddy, okay, here's my delivery condition checklist. Deliver it to me. Go ahead. You think you can do it cheaper? Go nuts. So the cost of delivering what I would consider a restaurant grade shell has tripled in the last couple of years. So a hundred bucks a foot just does not go very far. Now I'm going to shut up and let somebody else talk because I can literally talk about this for, for the entire allotted time. So I, I want to hear the office perspective and then I'm, I'm happy to circle back if, if people ask specific questions about, about retail restaurant TI because it's a massive part of the game. Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to dive into that more because, I mean, that that's the thing that I've always thought is like restaurants and medical office space. Those yes. two are hands Absolutely. down the craziest on, on tenant improvements. Now, they're also two of the best, you know, tenants you could represent. But that makes those negotiations really, really complicated because these businesses really do, I mean, you know, some of them actually need it. Some of it's like, you know, the the owner of, of the Buffalo uh, Bills uh, getting the state to basically pay for another, you know, multi-billion dollar stadium when they're a multi-billionaire themselves, you know. Uh, maybe it's just a little bit of incentive to actually sign that lease. But, Jesse, let's let's dive into Office TI because, you know, when I, when I first got started – um, I was working on mostly like class B office space. We didn't even necessarily have to do TI because everybody just wanted paint and carpet. Uh, but it's, it's gotten a little more complicated, just like restaurants over the years. So catch us up kind of on what's going on in the office world. Oh, Jess, you might be on mute. Nope, still on mute. Oh God! There we go. Right. Yeah. So, in terms of the um, the office side, a lot has changed over the last couple of years, especially given COVID, where a lot of the uh, in basically the tenants' wants right now is turnkey built-out space. So, to just back up, when I got in the industry, you hear TI, TIA, TA, and you're trying to figure out what are all these terms and. TA, usually the tenant allowance, it's very specific. Sometimes TI in our industry is used as tenant inducement, which might not necessarily be an allowance. It might be free rent or other concessions that the landlord makes. So in terms of the actual improvement allowance, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it's not just cash that the landlord is giving you. There are certain components. I just pulled up one of the leases that we did recently. And you have to, before COVID, before all, you know, we were looking only for the most part for turnkey space for tenants, a lot of times it would be very specific as to what you can use that for. So you would have to use it as it sounds, an improvement allowance of some sort. 
now I think we're we're a little bit more open to using it towards uh, towards rent, towards different fees, project management fees associated with a build out, because oftentimes now individuals are not actually or companies are not actually building out complex space in the office side. They're getting relatively turnkey space, but they still want some sort of cash injection from the landlord. Um, I think the other piece, both of the both of the guys here kind of hit the nail on the head when it comes to you know people will ask us, well, how, what's the allowance for this deal uh, for a certain net rent. And it's usually not that easy because it, it does come down to the tenant's covenant. If it's a tenant where you're going to trust giving them, you know, 30, 40, $50 cash. Now, in terms of the actual brass tax of like what we're seeing in the market, um, you know, I think 40, $50 would have been a big TI, um, you know, four or five years ago, at least in our market. Now that's, you know, that's not the craziest thing. You know, we see landlords actually mark, actually marketing $75 for certain tenants, um, depending on the asset and how much they want to move it. But yeah, a lot of the new developments we're seeing is actually getting up to, uh, you know, 50, 60, $70. And then what they actually end up giving can be higher than that. And they, you know, they don't want to market that to the, uh, to the general population. Can you speak to the difference in like class A versus B versus C? on those on those TI uh, just ranges? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's probably a function of the ownership types. Um, you know, oftentimes the deeper pockets on the AAA stuff where you're, you know, there's the ability to actually put a large amount of cash into the deals. In terms of the uh, the build out though, I think the, the class B stuff is is in a position where some of this some of the stuff is fairly dated. So there is going to be some cash that needs to be put in the deal. but Oftentimes what I've seen with clients is when we look at, say, $40 or $50 of cash in, you know, for my, say, tenant client, sometimes it's easier just to say, hey, let's allocate that $50 to the landlord to build out the space as part of leasehold improvements because they have the contractors in the building. They're familiar with the building. Um, so oftentimes we, we kind of do it that way um, because, like I said, a lot of the stuff now, uh, you know, I'm having clients that are asking for small tenant allowances that aren't really even building anything out. They're applying it to to rent or other expenses. Before we we get into negotiating on the landlord side, I want to throw this out there. I mean, what are y'all's thoughts uh, on the tenant rep side for negotiating for free rent versus like a rent abatement versus tenant improvements? I mean, that seems to be, you know mostly in either or situation sometimes you can negotiate both but you're going to get a little bit of smaller both i mean as a landlord i much prefer giving free rent right because i don't have to come out of pocket for anything i don't necessarily have to worry about it um, and i can actually give the tenant kind of an equivalent amount of capital that way um, but i mean i know it depends on a case-by-case -case scenario so you know chad we'll start with you i mean what are your thoughts on that for i mean that's probably more common in industrial than it is in the other two yeah, it's pretty common. Even even in a hot market, it's not uncommon for a tenant to be able to negotiate free rent of some amount. It might be short. It might be one month of a fixed dream period. It might be one month gross free rent. Uh, but yeah, that, it is pretty common. And for the reasons that you mentioned as well, a landlord doesn't have to be out of pocket any money. Uh, they if they have to forego collecting rent for a month or so, that property might have sat vacant for that month anyways. So I think a lot of landlords are more receptive to offering free rent, but it still comes down to it being a lever. If if you're pulling a lever where you're asking for free rent, that means something has to give on the other side. So does that mean that the, the rent has to go up? Is it the longer term lease? There's so many variables that go into it that a tenant can't just expect to say, well, just throw in three months of free rent into the offer and hope that they give it to us because a landlord's ultimately going to run numbers on what they budgeted, what this deal is going to cost them. They're going to start doing an NER calculation. And it's it's an input no different than a tenant incentive. Uh, so a tenant improvement incentive. So I, I think um, generally speaking, landlords will be more receptive to free rent, but it's that's not a given though either. It's Some landlords will just say, no, these are the terms of my, of my lease and I'm just going to hold firm to it. I'll offer a TI because this work needs to be done regardless. So it, it really can depend. And that's, that's probably an answer that's so wishy-washy here that, that we're probably all going to echo is that it, it really is difficult because in, in any given deal, you've got a tenant that's unique and you've got a landlord that's unique and you probably have brokers uh, involved that are also going to have unique styles. So it's, it's what, 
makes our business so interesting is that there's no two deals that look anything similar whatsoever. Yeah, that's uh, definitely some job security there. Um, Adam, let's get to you next, and then we'll go to Jesse. I mean, you know, with retail and office TI, the norm just going up as much as it has. I mean, that's had to have kind of shifted how you guys are approaching some of these deals, but it's also had to have created a very interesting environment out there where there's still some of the old school landlords that are looking at it from a different perspective. I mean, you know, you hear $100 a square foot in TI, and that's crazy because before COVID in Nashville, like $35 a foot in TI was an insane number. Like only the cream of the crop, class A, new construction spaces would get that. Um, I mean, what's your approach today compared to what it was five years ago? Um, I'm happy to jump to you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so there, there's definitely like a haves and have nots when it comes to TI, right? You got you most, and, and again, I'm speaking for what I do, right? I tend to handle, you know, kind of bougier institutional grade retail uh, and kind of urban core kind of markets, right? So I'm not the best person to ask about your know, class B, class C strip centers in, you know, secondary and tertiary markets, right? So caveat. That said, there is definitely like a haves and have nots um, on TI. The people that are willing to play the TI game can usually uh, get a commensurate rent, right? Like, I mean, we're doing rents, your know, rent that uh, would have been 35, 36, 38, um, you know, pre COVID is, is now, you know, we're doing deals in the fifties in some of these markets net. So for us, I know the people in, in New York and, and even DC and, and, and Boston, th those aren't, those numbers aren't shocking, but in, in Charlotte to be huge, then 40 used to be huge. And now, um, you know, I, I sent an LOI out at 60 the other day. So. Uh, there is there is definitely a, a a rise in rent that goes along with these larger TIs. So that that is that is the good news. Um, but agreed that it's a very different conversation than it was a couple of years ago. Um, and just to touch on the the free rent question that was asked that that Chad took a second ago, um, free rent is very very common in retail. Um, you know, some people call it a fixturing period, build out period. These build outs are, are very complicated and the the minimum, if I'm representing representing a tenant, the minimum I would ask for is, is six months of free rent um, to, to get something done. But savvy tenants are now tying that time to uh, receipt of permits, all applicable permits, right, with the exception of, of liquor. So, so that has changed, uh, and without getting into m the minutia, uh, that that free rent is kind of just SOP now. So, I'll shut up and and listen to office. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because I while you were talking, I, I ran the math on a two thousand square foot space, asking thirty dollars a foot in rent, right? Pretty pretty normal for you know let's say Nashville. Uh, if I was going to give seventy five dollars a foot in TI on that. And I was going to bake it, amortize it back into the rent over a five-year period at 8%. It adds $18.25 a square foot to the base rent. So now I have to charge $48 a foot instead of 30 in order to justify that, which makes sense as to why rental rates have gone up so much in the past few years. I mean, I don't know necessarily where I'm going with that, but interesting food for thought as you're thinking about, uh, I mean... At the end of the day, somebody mentioned this earlier, it's, it's all levers, right? It, which lever am I going to pull to make this financially work? Okay, well, today, I guess we're giving a whole bunch of TI. So that means we're going to have to charge a whole lot of rent. At some point, land, you know, tenants will say, actually, I just want cheap rent. I don't want any TI. And it, it might shift back, but I don't know. Interesting. Jesse, what about, uh, what about office? Yeah, well, that's also, you know, I think we talked about this uh, on the show before where when COVID was at the beginning when everything was happening, everybody was saying, well, why haven't office net rents gone down? And it's like, no, because inducements, whether it's free rent or uh, allowances went up, but the net rents stayed the same. So what that tells you is the net effective rent, the NER was actually going down. Uh, it just wasn't being illustrated in the net rents. Um, in terms of the free rent uh, question of free rent versus inducement, um, I don't know a listing I have right now that doesn't have kind of a $20 tenant allowance baked into it. 
Um, in terms of what the preference is, it's, it, you know, really is dependent, like Chad was saying, dependent on the landlord. Uh, it's not necessarily one or the other. Uh, I would say a fun kind of factoid is that a lot of times in our market, the brokers get paid 50% on lease execution and 50% on rent commencement. So if you negotiate your uh, your tenant, I say client, a six month free rent or one year free rent, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. And we've had this conversation with landlords before that it should be on commencement or occupancy. Uh, that's just kind of an aside, but in terms of the, uh, what, what landlords are also doing is that when they have the free rent, I'm not sure if uh, if Adam or if Chad, you see it on the retail or industrial side, the, the, like Adam was saying, we'll, we'll call it a fixturing period, but we'll also do it what we call out of term. So it could be a five year plus six month deal where that six month period is the rent free period. And oftentimes landlords do that because they don't want it affecting their, you know, quote, quote NER, the net effective rent uh, to kind of mess up their economics on their side. But yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing. Do you guys ever just add additional the back end on deals like that so they can still get their full tenure term? Like it's it's in effect tenure and six month deal or or something like that. We we do that a lot to just kind of yeah. pull those. Different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we do that same thing too. I mean, I, you know, it, it just helps to make sure. I mean, one, I always did it as a broker to make sure I was getting paid on a full 10 year deal <laughs> instead obviously. of like a, I mean, obviously. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I guess, I guess I've kind of carried that habit into ownership. I don't know that it necessarily actually matters or changes valuations or anything like that, but uh, like from a, from an ownership perspective, but I guess it's nice to have a clean 10 year deal starting out. Let's, let's talk about uh, the landlord side and Adam, we'll start with you. Uh, you know, negotiating tenant improvements from the landlord side, what are you needing from the tenant in order to justify, uh, one, the amount of capital you're going to be giving them, but two, to securitize it? You know, it's really different if you're talking about first gen space or second gen space, right? And, and we've kind of been tiptoeing around that a little bit in this conversation. I mean, the difference, let, let's say I have a, a first generation space that is right on our corner and it is really going to be kind of our in fill anchor right because you know burlington coat factory isn't an, isn't the anchor anymore for for urban deals right it, it's these hip restaurants that you can then kind of craft a merchandising narrative around and 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 then you know really get a rise in, in the stack above you through rents in either office or or resi right so let's say it's this it's this sexy restaurant corner you're able to justify rents using the math that I, that I just said, right? Like we're not going to get top billing upstairs in the stack if we don't have something cool downstairs. So that's something to important to remember. Um, the other thing that is really important to remember, and this will get you thrown out of boardrooms, right? This is like a dirty little secret. Here's the thing. We're going to have to pony up money up front to get this thing to a restaurant shell, right? But if but once you have a second generation restaurant or retail bay, if it was worth 30 to go into sec when, when somebody's looking at a second generation, it's worth 35 or 40. Right. And that is just it's just the nature of the business. People want they they look at it and say, wow, I can go in there and get up and running in 90 days instead of 240. I can spend, you know, 200,000 instead of 400,000 because all the expensive crap is paid for in the back, the HVAC and the and all the drainage and the MEP like I mentioned. So there's there's a couple different ways to justify it. Now, somebody still got to write a check, right? Like that's still somebody still has to write the check, but it's a little easier to get a well-capitalized and savvy landlord on board with a big TI if you have approvals if you're able to check the contractor, if you get to approve construction plans before it's done, you know, th there's some guardrails that you can that you can build in to make sure your money is being spent in an intelligent way. We uh, we recently encountered a landlord that is, I, I guess, newer to restaurants um, that went out and built a space, didn't consult any commercial real estate brokers on how to do it. I know first like big red flag right there. Um, but they they went ahead and installed. I mean, they built a cold dark shell. They stubbed in the MEP, uh, and then they uh, already did the grease trap. And they tried to list it with us, 
with no further tenant improvements because they said it's already it's already zoned for a restaurant and it already has the the restaurant infrastructure in it. So, you know, any tenant needs to come in here and do whatever they want to do. I mean, how do you deal with clients like that to help them understand? Because I would imagine there's a lot of commercial real estate brokers out there. There's a bunch of newer commercial real estate brokers that listen to this show. How do you handle a landlord that has unrealistic expectations like that? So the difference between the way I handle it now and the way I handled it 10 years ago is massive. Because in you know 10 years ago, that deal, you might be counting on that deal to pay your mortgage or you know, get baby new shoes, whatever it is. Um, and you'll kind of tell people what they want to hear in order to get the business because you need the sign, you need whatever. So I might have been less honest, or maybe I just didn't know as much as I know now, right? Some somewhere in between in between there, we'll call it. Uh, now, I'll just straight up say like, listen, this is what I would do. And this is what I would need to lease this space. And it's pretty straightforward. I mean, I have a you know, a Rolodex of, of uh, work letters and, and condition reports that uh, or condition requirements that all of these people need. And I'm like, if you didn't do this, then you're throwing you, you were just throwing bad money out there or throwing good money at a, at a bad problem. So uh, I'm pretty honest and straightforward with what needs to be done. Uh, I had a call with a huge institution. Um, maybe two weeks ago where I basically told him like, listen, everything in your plan is wrong. Everything. Like I get that your core and shell or multifamily architect also does retail and also does restaurants and, and don't worry, we got it. You don't need to bring in a specialist. I'm just, life's too short, man. I, I've tried to go in and fix stuff too many times and it never works and everybody's just pissed off at each other. So, I'm a little blunt in the way I respond to that stuff now, uh, because otherwise you're just gonna you're gonna spin wheels, you know. So so I'm I'm pretty blunt these days with the way I, I attack that. Yeah, I love that. And and look, kitchen buildouts are so specialized. I mean, we're we're doing a, a boutique hotel right now. We hired a different architect specifically to work on the bar and kitchen because they are so <laughs> different. The layouts. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the layouts that that regular architects think that a kitchen should have. Uh, yeah. that, I mean, clearly they've never worked on kitchens before. The number of arguments I get into with multifamily architects, which is so crazy. Like I don't, I, I don't get paid to argue with really good core and shell high rise office architects. Like it's just, it's not in my job description. I'm like, listen, I've done a hundred of these things, but you know, if you, if you think a 200 amp panel can power a 6,000 square foot restaurant, okay. Fine. Oh, you want to put a grease trap in, even though you have no idea what kind of restaurant it is and you don't know what the, the menu is and you don't know what size the, the city's going to require. You want to put that? Okay, go nuts. Oh, no ingress, <laughs> no ventilation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they can wheel their trash around the block at five o'clock and through the through the building lobby. Okay. Yeah. Good idea. No. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> oh, parking's you know, on the second all- floor and the stairs down from the parking lot are on the opposite side of the building. Perfect. Customers are going to love They'll that. They'll figure it out. They figured out in New York. <laughs> That's my favorite one. They figured out in New York. Like, yeah, there's a million people that can walk to you in New York. It's not you know, yeah. Matthews, North Carolina is not the same thing. Uh, it's totally different. Jesse, what about you on, on the uh, on the landlord side in office space? Because, I mean, especially over the last couple of years, I mean, I'm curious to know, you know, within the post-COVID world, I mean, how are how are office landlords approaching, you know, their TI negotiations? Yeah, I think um, just in terms of your, the question on unrealistic or setting realistic expectations, the one nice thing with most of office is pretty standardized. The 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 clients we have kind of get, understand the market, they get the situation. I think the biggest change in the last few years is that things are just taking longer from the landlord side. Uh, people are, you know, it's the first time in a lot of markets that they've seen a tenant's market in years. So the the fact that, you know, for, for the first time in a long time, the landlords are actually having to roll their sleeves up, having to put proposals out instead of just waiting for offers. Um, so I think that all kind of factors into the, the tenant allowance. There's just a little bit more room for the, the tenant side to negotiate. Um, in terms of the realistic expectations, though, at, you know, at this point in my life, and I'm sure just like to, to Adam's point, as I, as I get older, I'm probably going to have less and less patience. I think you, gotta, you have to set the stage as quickly as possible. If there's something unrealistic, you kind of have to nip it in the bud. And it's hard to do 
almost impossible to do in the beginning of your career because you're just trying to say yes to everything. Um, but it really doesn't serve you uh, well to, you know, basically go on with this unrealistic expectation that a landlord might have because it's just going to hurt you in the currency of your agreement or, or worst case, you, you know, after six months or a year, mm. you don't renew because an expectation that was not realistic wasn't met. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting scenario, right? Mm. Like I, I will never forget the first client that I fired. I will. I I actually love telling people like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. We're we're not going to work on that. I, I don't have the time to deal with something like this. You know, that's not how this should be done. I mean, because it is a very powerful thing to to realize like, oh, cool. I'm I'm kind of at that point in my career where I can choose the things that are going to be good for my mental health as well as my bank account, <laughs> not just one or the other. Um, which is yeah. which is kind of funny, but. There, there is something to be said for being the guy that says, no, I'm actually not going to do that. And here's why. Because a lot of times yep. those tenants um, or, or landlords will actually come back and be like, wait, why? You're the only person that has told me no. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the really attractive girl that you're the, you're the only guy that's ever said no to her or you ignore her. You know, so they got to figure it out. They're like, why? Why are you ignoring me? Uh, same thing. I was never good at that. <laughs> you're never good at that one? <laughs> never good at that. <laughs> Oh man, it it just takes practice, discipline. Yeah. It's too late <laughs> yeah. for me. Now. <laughs> it's Wait. too late for you, man. You're married. Yeah. Oh man, Chad, what about you, dude? How's how's the industrial world? Yeah, I, I love everything you guys are saying about that, and and I've had conversations like that as well, where I've said to the to the person, "There's plenty of people will tell you what you want to hear, but I'm here to tell you what you need to hear if you want to lease the space." And that could be a little bit off-putting, but I also believe that sometimes we get paid for having awkward and uncomfortable conversations with people, and that's what our business is. Our, we're not just order takers where somebody tells us what they want to eat and we go and punch it into the kitchen and then we bring back the plate. We bring a lot more to the table and having the confidence to say bold things like that, even if it's very uncomfortable and pretend, potentially pisses off the person, maybe you lose that business. That's better than taking on a property and spinning your wheels, wasting time, having to be accountable for something that you can't even control. I'm with you guys. That's That's been an evolution of my career as well as, as picking and choosing what to work on and what not to work on. Uh, on, the, on the TI side from a landlord standpoint, industrial is a bit interesting from the standpoint that some upgrades can actually be considered capital expenses as opposed to a tenant improvement. So one that I've done recently is we had a, a fairly large industrial property that didn't have a lot of overhead doors. So the tenant that moved in there, I was representing the landlord, big institutional group. Uh, the tenant needed some more overhead doors put in. We actually treated it as a capital expense because that that's going to be useful for all tenants going forward. So instead of actually labeling that intentive, a tenant incentive, we actually just put that as a building cost, a capital expense on there. However, there's also some things that can be treated very specific to the tenant that's going in there that might not have any value, could actually be a liability to future tenants. And something like a jib crane, as an example, that might work for the one tenant going in there. But if that tenant leaves, we might not find another tenant that has a use for that. And now we have to take that out, decommission it. There's a lot of expense that goes into that as well. So it's, it, I hate keep going back to that uh, initial comment about it being case by case basis, but, but it really is. Uh, and, and forward thinking landlords will appreciate that tenants need to have certain things and they'll want to provide that to them so long as the economics make sense on it. But those same landlords might treat it that it's value add to the building itself. So I, I think it's, it really is, you have to come to a consensus. And and I really believe that as brokers is that we're not, we're not paid by the landlord. We're not paid by the tenant. We're paid by the deal. If the deal doesn't happen, we don't get paid anything. So we're really, we're all trying to represent our clients best interests. And we're trying to move everything forward. But if a deal doesn't happen, the landlord doesn't have a tenant, the tenant doesn't have a space and the brokers didn't get paid. So there is an effort that everybody wants to be moving that forward. And the only way to have that is to have open and transparent communication. Chad, can uh, you, can you uh, dive into the, uh, go ahead, Adam. No, I was just going to say that we do the, a very similar thing in retail 
um, even even down to the doors, right? Like if there's a really tired facade on a building, we could have a landlord dig into putting in some kind of like porous or operable storefront system like nano walls or accordion doors or something like that. Infrastructure can also be treated as a capital expense, even though it's a big part of the deal. You know, running a vent hood to a roof or, or out of a space, making sure all the utilities are upsized. So I've seen it skinned that way. And in fact, that is my overwhelming recommendation on first generation space is to is to dump that into a CapEx budget as opposed to a TI budget. So the, I couldn't agree more uh, with with that being a, a, a smart solution. Kyle, I see your question and we'll get to it right after this. I want to make sure that we kind of pick this apart a little bit more. Uh, Chad and Adam, can y'all dig into that a little bit further? Why is it advantageous to treat it as a capital expenditure as opposed to a tenant improvement allowance? Because that's something that a lot, I feel like a lot of brokers don't know. And either one of y'all could take it. I mean, yeah, I'd say the most natural one is that it, it gets excluded from the deal economics. Uh, so a especially sophisticated landlords, they're going to have very elaborate and precise budgets on what numbers that they need to hit. And it's it's interesting how some tenants will come in and they'll try to push the envelope on and they'll try to make a really aggressive deal. And this is on the big landlord side, other landlords uh, might treat it differently. But these landlords, it's just it's just a budget decision it just really comes down to the economics to the economics of these deal when you run the the calculations does it make sense then yes we can proceed on a deal if you have an item like putting in some extra overhead doors which can be a sizable cost as you're cutting through concrete if you have that included in the deal economics it's not going to pencil a lot of the times but if you can treat that as a capital expense that's not getting factored into the deal so their whole approval process which often goes through multiple layers of of management decisions if you can treat that as a capex expense versus actually being baked into the deal it, it just makes the numbers that much more uh, palatable and easy to digest. So that'd be the main reason is just treating it as a CapEx removes it from the economic factors that go into that decision. That's exactly how I would have answered it. So that's, well, <laughs> perfect. we're on the same, I'm glad we're on the same yeah, page. I, I mean, it, those things are already baked in early. The institutional partners already bought in. You know, those numbers have been approved six months earlier and it doesn't get into some pissing contest or, you know, it, it's even the most sophisticated landlords have to win, right? That you get into the heat of that negotiation, be like, who the hell does this guy think he is wanting 150 bucks of a foot in TI? He would much rather have put it $50 extra into the shell, the corn shell, and it's only $100 TI. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. But Chad, you, you said it perfectly. Yeah. Sometimes in this game, it's it's all ego, which is hilarious. Oh, I mean, it's God. it's it's six six one hand, half a dozen the other. But just the way that you phrase it and it's worded totally changes how somebody feels about it. It's so funny, guys. I'm so sorry. I got to take kids to baseball. Love you guys. Do it. Enjoy Love baseball. You. Sorry, I have to jump early. I'm like you, man. I got. I've got a. Uh, I got, I got it. I'm basically like an Uber driver for sports, uh, but I always love these conversations and I learn something every time. And, and I really appreciate you guys. Yeah, man. Thanks, Good to see you. We'll see you next time. Okay. So Kyle, uh, Kyle was saying had an interesting deal on a new office build out shell space. So Jesse, we may volley this one over to you. Original proposal from landlord came back at $80 in TIA tenant countered at $125. That's a huge counter. I uh, tried to advise them that doing so would make them look less attractive as a potential tenant because there are others that are looking at the space. Tried to advise them to come in lower, but they insisted. What is your opinion on that scenario? Because I'm afraid they may, they may miss out. Yeah, so I guess the first thing, without any context of the market, if you know, if you're in a market where tenants are getting 100, 125, then obviously it's a different question. But if you have comps that are, you know, in line with that, say 80 or even lower, I think that that needs to be illustrated to the client uh, that your your ask might lose you the uh, the property. Um, there it might be a worth making a distinction here. Sometimes that this is tenant allowance cash, and sometimes these are leasehold improvements that the landlord is saying that they're going to put into the space. So based on the question, it sounds like it's an actual TIA. So it'd be curious to see what, what market this deal is in, because that's a pretty substantial, uh, even in my market, like the landlord having $80 as a, as a, uh, allowance is big, uh, countering at 125 is even obviously even bigger. 
Um, but yeah, I think that with anything like this with clients, you have to show them what is going on in the market. And if they're disconnected from that, then it's your job to show them. Yeah, I feel like we're going to find out that, that Kyle's like representing Apple and uh, <laughs> they're in San Francisco or something. Cra- I mean, that because that's crazy. Like, that's a lot of TI. I mean, $80 of, t- of TI in office space is a lot. Um, I yeah, get that it's coming from it's, Shell, but yeah, it's the Shell piece, right? That's that's a big challenge right now because we are dealing with properties that we're selling right now that are in Shell condition, um, and they have to have a big allowance in there because they're competing with some beautiful, absolutely turnkey space. Uh, Kyle said he's in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is that, even more surprising. <laughs> $42 per square foot asking price. Yeah, that's um, incredible. Yeah, I mean, Kyle, I, I I agree with Jesse on this one. I think that any issue like this that pops up in brokerage can always be solved by data, right? So if you have the data to kind of back up your assumption that 125 is too – oh, he said the Walton's actually on the building. I mean, as soon as he said Bentonville, I was like, yeah, Walmart has to be involved somehow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if you have the data that shows the tenant – that $125 is way too high. Um, I mean, there's there's really two things you can do. Work to convince them that $125 is too high or tell them that you're not going to work with them. Uh, because that's a very unrealistic ask if they think that, you know, I mean, if market's 80 and they want 125 no matter what, there's basically like only one way that you can go about doing that. And that's asking the landlord to bake it back into the rent. Like, I don't know. Most landlords are not going to be willing to accept that. I wouldn't think yeah, it, it double your rent. <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's, a, I don't know what 80 is over a 9% on a 10 year deal, but it's a lot. It's a lot of money. So I mean, 125, yeah. I should say. I mean, we saw what $75,000 did at 8% interest on a 2000 square foot space earlier, $18 a foot increase. So yeah. uh, it's quite a bit. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is, this is turning into like a commercial real estate investment uh, brokerage uh, issue where I'm, I think we're going to have to have a part two. Let's talk about structuring um, tenant improvements. When Whenever we're doing these deals, typically like from the landlord side, the, there's a very different way that I want it as opposed to on the tenant side. As a landlord, I want the tenant to go through the build-out process, pay for everything themselves, then come back to me at the very end of the process with receipts for all of the work done, lien waivers, from anybody that touched the job site. Uh, and then once I have received those, I'll give them their tenant improvements within 30 days of receipt of all the documents that I need. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, I get to ensure that the money that I'm giving them for tenant improvements is not being spent on ff and right? They're not spending it on random business stuff. It's going into my building, which means I get to depreciate it and it's actually improving the property. But two, the last thing that I want as a landlord is some you know, subcontractor to come up out of nowhere saying, hey, I never got paid on this. I'm putting a lien on your property because then it's my problem, right? So that's typically how I want it as a landlord. Let's talk about it from the tenant perspective, though. How do you typically negotiate it from the tenant side? And uh, Jesse, I'm going to start with you and we'll go to Chad. Sure. Um, I think it's our market's pretty standard that everything you just described is the way that deals end up penciling out. The idea, even sophisticated tenants or tenants with good covenant, uh, the idea of just handing them cash um, is fairly uncommon. Usually the stipulations are pretty clear that, uh, you know, the receipts have to be present, presented, the work has to be uh, confirmed, uh, the permitting. Sometimes they'll even be you know, additional uh, project management fees that the landlord adds in because they might re- have to review or see some of the drawings, even if that's kind of BS and they're just, you know, looking at it came from uh, a credible source. But yeah, for us, it's pretty standard that they will have to do all of this before uh, the landlord cuts a check. Now, the bigger the client or the bigger the tenant gets, the, the more that you can kind of peel away some of that stuff, but it's uncommon to just hand cash. Agreed. Chad, what about you and industrial? Yeah, same thing. It'd be very uncommon for a landlord to give money up front. So if, if it was on the tenant side and it was that important, then get a line of credit, secure some additional source of, of funds so that you can pay your way through it. Because that's really what's going to come down to. If a tenant 
is con wants that money up front. It's because they need that money. Uh, it's the tenants that have that money available. Th th it's not an issue to them. They know that they'll have that money back at some point down the road. It's the tenants that just don't have the money to do it in the first place. So they, they either need to find a line of credit or get some additional money because it's there's, I can't think of many landlords that would be open to providing draws on that. Uh, but I mean, it, it's, it's all risk tolerance. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing that there is a landlord out there that would consider doing that for the right tenant on the right deal, the right securitization, right level of comfort, knowing that their pain draws at certain levels. I suppose that's possible, but that's probably going to be a fl uh, flag for the landlord already that if the tenant doesn't have access to money for short term interim financing, even that's probably a, a red flag because uh, if the money's coming back to them anyways, you really just need to bridge or have interim interim uh, money available. So for a tenant not to have that would probably be concerning. Yeah, we were uh, we were diving into letters of intent last week at a lunch and learn that I was doing with my commercial real estate team or my brokerage team. And this this TI discussion came up. And Phil, who's on my team, he uh, he moved here from San Francisco a couple of years ago, and he had a completely different experience with how TI was handled, and I, it blew me away. So in San Francisco, apparently, I mean, and, and he worked in the office space, apparently the landlords, as soon as the lease was executed, would write a check and give the cash immediately to the tenant for their build-outs. And I was like, why in the world would a landlord do that? And Phil was like, well, man, I mean, you know, they're dealing with a lot of these tech companies that have just finished, you know, a seed round or an A, B round, whatever it is, for, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars. And so they know that the, the company's good for it. <laughs> I was like, well, that's I guess that's a totally different environment. <laughs> They're good for it that day. What happens if the, yeah. something goes wrong the next day and they lose that hundred million? I, I still yeah. wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it either. I mean, what what happens if you're writing that check to the next WeWork, <laughs> to Adam Newman's <laughs> new startup concept? Oh man, I'd take a hard pass on that. Um, well, we're coming up on on you know 13 minutes left, give or take. So I'm probably just going to break off the last two parts. We can make this a a part one and part two. Um, any other you know kind of final closing thoughts on negotiations or structures when it comes to tenant improvements i want whoever take it yeah happy yeah. to jump in and then uh, uh jesse you can maybe uh, uh add anything that uh because i just had a comment on on kyle's point there as well and i'm not an office uh yeah yeah guy by any means but i i would just try to flush out why they want that extra $45 a, a square foot uh, for that. Like what's what's the real reason there? Are they trying to apply that towards rent? Uh, do they want that money just up front? Do they need that money? What's the real reason there? And if it's, if it's just an ask, if they're just like, well, you know what, we think the office market sucks, so we're gonna just try and bend the landlord over here. Well, let's, let's do a net effective rent calculation here and like let's actually plug this in to a model and show how that's going to reduce the net rent i think you said 42 dollars a square foot how does that extra 45 dollars a square foot impact what they're already giving so if they're already given 80 and they want 125 what's left at the end of the day and is a landlord really going to look at a deal if they're only getting five or ten dollars uh, on an ner or are they just going to wait just leave it vacant until another tenant comes along and you said it best tyler it's uh, you can solve these problems with data if uh if, if every other lease comp that you have showed that 80 dollars was fair well that's you you add that to an ner calculation and it's pretty compelling that their ask is just egregious now on the other hand 125 might be the market price uh like that maybe the landlord's trying to uh give a really low number so i would just i'd probe more just uh like, like i can appreciate the amount of information kyle's already given but i would just i'd really dig just try and figure out what what's their reasoning behind wanting to increase the TI by 50% because that's a sizable increase. But I would just try and figure it out, get to the bottom of it. And I think that that's that's what our, why we have so much value in the leasing equation. And property that I own myself, I would hire a leasing broker if, if I didn't, 
if I wasn't a leasing broker in addition, just because of the value that they bring in trying to be arm's length from the situation, but also being objective and bringing more to the table beyond. A, and I, I just, I say this all the time. We can't be order takers in this business. If we are just order takers, we're going to be replaced by Tesla robots in no time. So we have to bring more to the table. Uh, and in my mind, that's probing, really figuring out what the motivation is and trying to come up with a creative solution. That's, that's where I think we get paid uh, for what we do. Jesse, what about you? Yeah. I really like that. I uh, can be order takers. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of closing thoughts, I, I definitely agree with everything uh, Chad just said. And to echo what we've all kind of been saying this whole time is that every deal, it's a kind of a cliche, but every deal, especially in our industry, is slightly different than the other. And there's very rarely a one size fits all. So I think part of, again, just adding the piece of value, what we add is that we look at a deal that's slightly different and we have potentially a novel solution or a novel idea, something that fits for that particular deal. So, yeah, I think these are they're great questions. And I think a lot of what we covered is is what we actually see boots on the ground. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, as a commercial real estate broker, the question why is your best friend? Because if you don't know what somebody's motivations are, um, you know, why they're approaching this, it's going to be difficult for you to do your job, which is to negotiate a deal in which everybody wins so that it gets closed, right? Um, you know, that's the problem with attorneys. They're one-sided. They only care about one side. They actually want deals to not happen for whatever reason. Jeez, I mean, I can't tell you how many nightmares I've got with attorneys. Or so I tell my team, slowly. oh, yeah, <laughs> dude, it happens all the time, man. I, I tell my team, look, as a commercial real estate broker, you are the only one in this deal that wants it to happen. <laughs> the landlord doesn't want it to happen. I don't know why. The tenant doesn't want it to happen. I don't know why. The the I mean, you can go down the list. The lawyer, the CPA, the contractor. Nobody else in this deal wants this to happen except for you. You've got to figure out how to make it happen. So that's what we'll leave you guys with this week. Uh, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks for another Brokers Roundtable. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you then. Cheers, this Paul. episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com.